The Merovingians is the name of the rulers of the line of kings that came out of France from about 500 A.D. to about around 850 A.D. You're going to find that these descendants of these kings are the ones who today believe themselves still to be the successors in this Merovingian rule, claiming the rights to provide the hidden behind the scenes leadership to the world. And yet they're admitting here that America is the chosen land, the chosen people, and that it's the chosen language. Excuse me, what about the Balfour Treaty of 1917 that said the chosen people and the chosen lands were in Israel and the Middle East? These are the same people that controlled the government and all those things going down. And they're telling you in their hidden documents that we lied to you, that the chosen people are in America, and this is the chosen land and chosen language. Ten, we believe in divine dispensation through the spiritual and royal decrees. Oh, there is a God, but he rules through them. They're the chosen one to give you the knowledge of what he wants you to do. Eleven, we believe in the royal marriage where a man and a woman are sealed for all time and eternity. We do not believe in divorce or separation in the royal marriage. 12. We believe they'll get into adultery in a minute for you people like Caleb that's got a major interest in that. We believe that true balance is order and chaos within the individual. 13. We believe that all priestesses, high priestesses, and princesses must be of water only and not fire. And thus they should not have any fiery or aggressive traits, nor should they take smoke and fire into their lungs, as is the requirement stated in the Pistosophia and the Book of the Holy Grail. And we translate this as smoking and aggressive attitude. And she who takes does take fire and smoke into her lungs is not of the Holy Grail. Do you ever notice how there's getting to be more and more political laws these days about public smoking? Gee, I wonder who has a lot of political clout that might behind, be behind some of that. 14, we believe in the fight between good and evil, and we reject the ways of Lucifer, Lilith, the hairy night fiend, and the triple-headed Hecate. 15, we believe that all priestesses, high priestesses, and princesses must be opposite to both Lilith and Hecate. 16. We believe in raising our children to be high priests and high priestesses, and she who will become a princess is cherished above all as she is sacred. 17. We believe that divine mathematics can show us the path to illumination, and that here is divine truth as shown in the chosen language. Those are a brief statement of the beliefs of the Merovingian Gnostic Church. Merovingian is of a circle of a lily will be born such a great prince, goes in ancient poetic verse. 
Very soon and late he will come into his province. One of the ties of Merovingian line of kings was to the star of David and to the form of a lily, like in Fleur de Lis. And so all of the symbols out of the French rulers of the Fleur de Lis really are a tie back to the Merovingian kings. And that comes from the name of Lily of Florence or a flower. And um, this ties back to some of the early kings of the Merovingian line. As for the question of Merovingian propaganda in France, everyone knows that the publicity of Antar Patrol with a Merovingian king holding a lily and a circle is a popular appeal in favor of returning the Merovingians to power. The Merovingians actually came into Gaul as kings. It has been suggested that their royal lineage comes from Israel, Judah. Since their royal heritage is in their blood, they have no need of crowning by the church. When they were deposed, the church began to anoint in effect to make other kings under the church's authority. This seems to jibe well with previous prophecies interpreted that when Mars is attacked and Mars deals, Prince Mars deals with symbols attached to the Merovingian kings, that when Mars is attached and his blood is spilt, that to him it is an anointing. His rightful heritage is in his blood. He has no need as other monarchs for church approval. French kings subject to the Merovingians often took Merovingian princesses to wife to legitimize their claim. Their rightful heir could certainly have the blood of more than one royal house flowing in his veins. The fleur de lis is actually a form of the cross. Here is a website, merovinian.htm space icon or at least merovinian.htm, www. You might try that. If not, just do a web search. The fleur de lis is actually a form of the cross. The three petals represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The coin symbol is similar to the fleur de lis. It has a cross at top and petals on either side denoting three. It has a triangular base. The Star of David is made by joining the two triangles. Thus, the triangular base plus the floor de lis is just a disjointed Star of David. Both of these are Judeo-Christian symbols. These signify that the royal line is from Judah. There exist Holy Grail societies and other Merovingian groups that look for the eventual return to power of that ancient dynasty. They probably have a candidate for the crown prince. Research into their beliefs are startling. They strike at the very heart of Christianity. Among other things, they do not accept the resurrection. They disregard the written history in favor of hypothesis based on faulty reasoning and conjecture. The true heir will rise to power with the signs of the Godhead on his person. Birthmarks of the triangle representing the Star of David, signifying the true royal line through Judah, and the fleur de lis, which is a stylized crucifix. These threes both, both represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Their rightful heir will be a follower of Jesus, Christ resurrected. 
It is ironic that the Merovingian societies in their apostate condition will likely reject the very leader they have waited so long for just as the Jews rejected Jesus. These Merovingian Holy Grail societies' beliefs may help explain the prophecies of the anathema chapter. These beliefs are anathema worthy of excommunication. I have searched the law in the scriptures. I believe that the Merovingian line will be realized with an heir. But the society beliefs must be changed if they are to have any part in him. That is basically um, most of some of the, just the outlines of what was going on and what was present here. I thought what was extremely interesting in terms of this subject was the way it is treated in the Matrix 2 with that name as though this particular person has a lot of the credibility of the matrix in deciding who gets what, who learns what, and who does what. Okay. Last week, um, I had talked about uh, the concept of... Um, Victoria being out of jail, she's doing quite well now. She is getting back into a lot of her uh, setup of a lot of the seminars and things that she is doing. She had a number of those set up before she was in jail, and she's now got a couple of those uh, seminars set back up again and rescheduled, and as I get information about those, I'll let you know. I believe sometime this fall she was supposed to have set one up for Cleveland, too. And as of my last discussion with her, uh, she has not got a date or a time set certain on that yet. But believe me, she has already started helping a number of people, uh, just like she had been before she was in jail, and she's just that much sharper now that she's gone through a lot of this experience herself. So if you're out in our, our um, extended tape land here, virtual audience, and you want Victoria to come in and do one of these seminars that she does so well and give you background, uh, get back to her. If you're interested in getting uh, my seminar that I did in San Diego, California in February, of 2003, you can get those audio tapes from Victoria, and in order to get those, just email her to uh, her email address, which is Big Bop Tutor, B I G B O P T U T O R, at I believe it's yahoo.com. Yes, I'll double check that and let you know if that's not right next week, but I believe it's. Big Bob Tutor at yahoo.com and just remind her about that, uh, about those tapes and she'll tell you what you need to do to get them. That seminar has a lot of the information that we've had on these Monday night tapes for over several, several years and that information on that San Diego seminar of 16 hours of audio tapes condenses most of this disjointed information down into a somewhat uh, continuous, sensible production. Yes, uh, would you like to make a comment? Yes, uh, this is Joe Sherry. Um, I just got an email from Victoria exactly along the lines that you were saying. And tentatively, uh, according to the email, she's got a um, seminar in Cleveland for August 22nd through the 24th. I just passed a paper around, asked people who were interested in that seminar to sign in on it. Um, the time hasn't been set. I don't even know that the costs have been set yet. I'm sure they'll be similar to what they were last year. So if anybody's interested, 
let me know, sign that piece of paper back there. Um, and I just was going to say everything that Jack already said, that uh, according to her email, um, she says that the angel with the inkwell is pleased to announce that its ministry is up and operating once again. So she's back on stream, and anyone interested, sign in. The email address is, as Jack said, it was bigbobtutor at yahoo.com. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Um, while we're on that uh, subject, uh, Victoria contacted me about the situation of being out on a parole. She read her parole requirements. Sounds like everything would happen to us. They have the right to seize, search, um, whatever they want to do. That's what they can do to us on a normal basis. If you want to stop us in our car and ask us for our driver's license and, and inspect things, they certainly can do that. Uh, but they made her new offer. So I'll see what happens with that. They, um, she reported, she went and followed the contract. See, the parole is a contract. And um, so she followed the contract, and uh, the results of the following the contract requ uh, required her to you know, make a personal visit. The, and the agent wasn't there. Another agent made another offer to her, and she has 30 days to respond to this new offer. I think she's going to respond. We worked out a, a certain, uh, we worked out a little bit of advice, you know, a little letter of advice with that offer being returned. And um, based upon if they have a claim, you know, what's going on here. And uh, she's going to, I said that last time we went through this with an individual, request release of the parole under the new offer. And so we'll see what happens. But it's interesting that the agents of the government um, even though you have a contract, they still still want to renegotiate um, all the time. And they think that uh, maybe we do not have enough knowledge to be able to respond. Well, let's hopefully this will work. I was pretty excited when she read it. I said, whoa, 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 that's an offer. <laughs> it's a new offer. And uh, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to hope uh, that um, it does you know, go the route and we get some response from the agencies to see what they're going to do. Uh, because indeed, if this is a, a a charge, and it's just a made-up charge, or it's a charge in which they want you to respond to, and if she has done things correctly, and the parole is um, is a contract that she entered into, then um, they've changed that they changed that contract or made a new offer. Even though the contractor is continuing, that contract is continuing. There was another offer made. I'm trying to review that in my mind right now, and I, I see no other loophole in it. So we're going to see if this process is going to work again. Yes, Pete? The new offer eliminate the old no. I, I don't see it eliminating it. I see there's a new offer out there, and it's an opportunity to do an acceptance and a return on the new offer and failure to respond. Um, you could ask that the, um, you know, that the exchange will be such that the uh, uh, conditions of parole be um, eliminated, stop, because everything is hinged upon that initial contract. What is it? And uh, it's a bartering point. See, what's for value here? What is the value? Well, the value we have is this contract, it's a parole contract. So we're trying to figure out value. She says, well, do I have to buy from it? No. So she was going to put a bill lading together and, <laughs> and, and call it that and do the exchange and, and see how that sets up. So I believe her seminar is going to be very interesting. Yes, why don't you stay there for a second? I, I want to point out that Victoria is just like a lot of us. When something she doesn't understand or something goes wrong, she's like a sponge. She wants to try to understand what it is so that she can deal with it and correct it. And when she came out of jail and was on this probation, and she kept saying to me, read the probation document. This is something no one can live with. And she kept saying that there are many women that were in that jail with her. 
And its word on the street is when you go out on probation, the contract is written in such a way there's no hope and prayer that you're going to be able to abide by all the terms and conditions of the probation. And the reason they do that is because if you're a person that tends to get into a dishonor and you don't understand honor and dishonor, it's just a new offer, the probation, to get you out to again demonstrate your dishonor. And when you dishonor the probation, their goal is to put you back into jail for two and three times the amount of prison time under the dishonor to the probation contract than you would have stayed in and lived in jail had you just worked out your first contract and then gone out without probation. So there are people that are in jail that are scared to go out on probation because they know in their mind it is a trap to get them back into jail for longer periods of time. So rather than understand what the game is and the trick, they'll just say, well, just keep me here because I'm not going to go on probation. Now, we have said before, and we've talked a lot in the last six months about the trial and how the charging instrument in the trial is really an offer that's directed toward the defendant, the straw man. But of course, you're operating the straw man in your response to that offer. So if, the, if you don't show up, the living person, they can't do anything with the straw man because it's a fiction. They need you to show up because it's ultimately a test against you to see if you will dishonor their test toward the straw man, the defendant. Then we said once either the, the guilty plea is admitted or it comes into the trial, they go into stage two and the second test is the sentencing, which is really an offer and a test of the living man and the relationship that he had to the straw man who was charged with the charging instrument in the accusation of the trial. And even though they're still coming after the living soul, really the sentencing is directed at the living soul and his relationship to the straw man more than its charges against the straw man, i.e. your evil 15-year-old son that you, the living soul being the guardian of, has to come in and not argue the defense of the evil 15-year-old that committed the crime, but to be responsible for the settling of that matter and to resolve any physical or commercial liabilities that your evil 15-year-old created. Now, we've been dealing with this sentencing concept in our Monday night for the last couple of months. Now, all of a sudden, we're being brought in the direction of what's going on with this probation. And it looks like the probation is like the third out in the inning, where it, again, is a test and a trial. And when Victoria got out of jail, she's panicked. She says, I cannot live with this probation. They're going to use it as a, an excuse to come in and kill me. They're going to use it as an excuse to put me in jail for the rest of my life. What am I going to do? And I said, relax. First of all, it is an offer. Who do they make offers to? Who do they bring charges against? It can only deal with someone in commerce. It can't deal with people in the real world. They only bring offers to someone in the world of fiction. So I said, this probation is for the straw person. It's not for the living soul. And it's how the living soul responds to the offer to the 15-year-old evil son or ward 
that's going to determine what happens to you, the living soul, in your relationship with these people who are testing you. This is against the straw man again. It is not against the living soul. And it's just a test. Just like the trial. Just like the sentencing. And when Lee Bernasek was helping this young man out up in Wisconsin and Minnesota here a couple of weeks back, actually he and I have been talking to this young man for a month, six weeks, yes, eight weeks. He's been in a constant hyper drive about what's going to happen to him, just like Victoria. And when it got down to the point where Lee suggested to him that he just accept the offer as a new commercial offer and ask them how they want to settle and close this matter and suggest to them that his intent was closing up the probation, getting rid of it, not extending it out for the two years, the three years, the 20 years, whatever it was, that actually when he went back and did honorable but correct responses to their overtures, it just like, it really surprised me, and I don't know why in retrospect, but it surprised me. He, he just wound up that probation yes. with those people in a heartbeat, which was supposed to go on for a year or two yet. It took ten days. It took ten days, ten and he days. wound up his probation. In its history, it's gone. They've settled. It's out of there. And so the whole concept, one, two, three, you know, you got three chances at this. The trial stage one, the sentencing is stage two, and probation when it comes about is just stage three. Deal with it. Respectfully accept it. Return it. Request settlement and closure. And then wind those affairs up. Is that not what you're seeing, Lee? Absolutely. It's a, it's a clean process that is only um, covered up because of the intimidation that it looks to be. And that's the hard part. And it's the same way when she kept reading the clauses in her probational statement and I said, I think they're just putting down and writing what they normally can do to all of us. I didn't see anything in there that was anything abnormal. They can do that to any of us at any time. They just simply wrote it out in in very explicit terms, you know, so, so as to intimidate. And uh, you know, she goes, "Oh, so if you just back off on that and don't let the mind become intimidated by the response they're trying to attain, that is argumentative, and say there's no way." Um, you know, this patriot's going to be able to do that. You say, well, no, I do. So I just go ahead. That's a nice offer. Go accept it and run from there. And, and I'm hoping this will, will happen because it would be an excellent study. Because we know from all the experience it works, it works at that level. I mean, somebody says, well, what level does this work at? I think we, we you know... Jack and I have experienced from different levels all the way up to ridiculous and, and have nothing happen except the fact that they put in a public record some sort of a, um, a comment. They put their, their comments in a public record and then they close the book. And, and the book is there for all the Esquires to open up and to learn from so that they can go ahead and learn how to proceed among, in the court in which they have a title of nobility. You know, I look at those case things, those case studies, and I think that they're all designed in order to help teach their esquires um, what they are to do when they're before nobility. Um, but I, I think what it, we have here is a good opportunity for us to really understand the procedure of acceptance and how to put the affidavit together of your, um, the fact that you know you have no contract here you are bringing forth uh, the acceptance of your and the, the acceptance of the facts and the fact that you have more facts to bring forward, and it's you know it just opens it up and said okay, balls in your court, you know 
What are you going to do? I'm willing to, I'm here to settle. And the, and then I'm thinking now that all the times people have sent me faxes and letters and emails and everything on, because Jack and I sometimes talk with people on the phone and they ask questions and, and get packets and fill it out and then go ahead, come back with everyone I have says that that official in the government did not want to go into a hearing with a certificate of dishonor. Didn't want it brought into the hearing before the judge. You know, someday they're going to call your bluff, I know. <laughs> but it happened every so far every time. And the only mistakes we've had is the individual has made mistakes that they've capitalized on, but they still wound up settling. I mean, so many times I hear people say, hypothetically, what if this happened? You know, then I would have done this. And they'll take that as a contract issue. So hopefully um, Victoria doesn't enter into any of these interrogatory kind of statements. And, and I, have a, I have a thing about that. When they invite you, okay, now, tell us your side of the story. I have a real problem with that. Even though they say, oh, that's not testifying. You know, whatever you say and do will be held against you. <laughs> I have a problem with that. I think if you just stick with the fact that you had a, a complete meeting at the mines and you have bringing those facts forward in written document and that can be authenticated and you're bringing them before a judge, I think that's all it's necessary to do. You don't have to get in there and start hypotheticating and, and, and start pontificating and, and start imaginating <laughs> what could happen um, if these things were true because uh, I, I really feel that's not the right forum for it. I think that education has to go again outside the court in some other location, not in that forum. So I know sometimes I've heard people say, no, it's okay to do that. And once you're in that position, it's fine. I haven't seen it work. I've seen the offer being made. The only offer I saw made which was really right and when finally you have the judge or the magistrate of whoever's in charge of that particular tribunal say, well, what is it we can do for you today? Wow. As soon as that's said, you, have your, you, you should have ready what is it that we can do for you. You better have that order of the court that you have already prepared that you put in there a petition and just simply bring it forward at that time. There's no reason to go ahead and start saying, well, <laughs> let's start from Genesis, <laughs> what you can do for me. And, and I feel that um, every time somebody does that, it falls backwards. And I'm hoping and, and I'm praying that Victoria um, keeps going in the direction she has been teaching in the seminars. Because I, I, I really enjoy the conversation I had with her and I really enjoyed when she was here. And, and I'm hopefully, I have to think about my schedule Hopefully I'll be uh, you know, to have one of our uh, Cleveland seminars to, to be able to go to. Um, what I would like to do, I'm not trying to hog the mic or anything, but is there any questions on this? Because people say, what, after we get done talking? I mean, while Jack and I are here, do you have any questions on the procedure? What new facts? What facts? What new facts? What new facts? Mm -hmm. She has the only new facts, if you're looking at Victoria's Secret, was, was that there was no contract, there was no agreement, there was no um, uh, deliberate denial of, of requested information. There's a lot of facts there that she has a time now to bring forward under her acceptance. That's pretty positive. And I know she's very intelligent and she will now know what t facts to bring in that are not um, admitted you know ad ex admitting to the charges and that's sometimes hard to do but he wants to argue those charges it, this is the facts fact is that she's living the fact is that she exists <laughs> these are facts and and I think if you stick with those I know it's hard until you get to your particular situation but um, the facts are the facts and, for instance, if an officer of the law comes up after 
the fact. That means after the condition happened and are going ahead and throwing charges in. Well, based on a, a decision as to, well, if that is the fact that happened, then obviously these things must have preceded it. And that's just plain charges. And they'll do that all the time. And they'll bargain with those things. And they'll be act very confident because they're told by the prosecutors, you go ahead and charge those people. Whatever you can, charge them. Because, you know, as you know, they may have five charges and they'll drop four and catch out one. I mean, this is the game. It's all theatrics. So the facts are something they don't have. They have no witness. They have no facts. And you have to remember that and just stick with the facts. And if you introduce new facts, those introductions have to be things that um, can be um, substantiated by as fact. You know, you're not, not conjecture, but as fact. Um, and also, all, all documents and facts have to be properly served so that when you go in there, they're all perfected. Because the other side won't do that. They'll ask you to authenticate their documents. They do it all the time. And we're finding the power in you holding that thing up and shaking it and looking at it and says, I see no perfection here. I cannot authenticate it and hand it back. Boy, I've seen that judges immediately or the magistrates hand it immediately back to whoever gave it to them. It doesn't even appear anymore. Hot so, potato. Yes. And, and that's a recent discovery because I've been in these, some of these hearings. I mean... I know I'm taking a chance someday there's going to be a target on my back, but it seems like the target on my back is the other way around. I'm receiving requests from the courts to come and observe hearings. So I say no. <laughs> I mean, I know it's an honor and I treat it as that. I do an acceptance. I really appreciate it. But I'm going to have to, you know, unless I am compelled to some other by some other means, but if it's a choice, because I don't want to get into that position where they're starting to abuse the observer. Because that's what they're going to do. They're going to tie you up and try to, you know, to smother you. It's, it's one of those things where they're trying to give too much. See? When you're, when you're asked to give or you have to do the acceptance, you have to give everything. You have to give them too much. So they say, well, no, that's too much. They start giving it back to you. And then when Jack went through that, and we, but I, did, I, did that, I did that with the one person having the children that were came out. Through it, gave everything. Well, and I took a leap of faith, but the results have been fantastic. I mean, this is going to be <laughs> this is very exciting. I, I I can I can see God's laws really working now. I mean, when we did that, it turned everything around 180 degrees. And so um, I know those are hard concepts, and I hope Victoria, you know, catches on to that too, because uh, I think that's a new element that uh, has been discovered. And the, and the practice seems to be working. So anyhow, didn't mean to go on there with that, but I thought that was pretty important because it's a follow-up from what we've been doing in, in the past on these tapes. Um, if there's not anything else, then we'll continue with our <laughs> original concept here. Okay, thanks, Lee. Do you have a comment, John? Yes. Uh, was she dealing, uh, Victoria, that is, is she dealing with one court or several? Uh, because when I was in Parma, 97, Parma remanded me over to county. County, near the end of my 18-month term of service, they, that is Parma, contacted me and wanted me to go through... Uh, what was it called again? Uh, meeting every once, once a month or so? Probation, yeah. Okay. They wanted me to go through probation. And I asked Parma, how much greater than county are you? Because county never said anything about probation. And now, show me where you're greater than county, and I'll abide by your terms. And, you know, they, they just let everything go. I never heard from them again. Uh, but going back to what you were talking about earlier, there was a man on George Norrie program, I believe it was Friday night, Saturday morning, or maybe it was Thursday night, Friday morning, coast to coast. Uh, he got into the subject of what you were talking about earlier, 
uh, the whole thing about uh, everything. I, I, I was getting real sleepy. I couldn't stay up for it anymore. I wish I could have got the man's name because he went into depth about everything that you were discussing about earlier in the evening. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was telling you about the gentleman in New York State I was helping who was in alternative me medicine and he was charged with 71 felonies. And he had been fighting with the attorney general, the prosecutors, the court, through patriotic efforts for a number of years, at least a year and a half. And they were doing a very good job of delaying. They were already gone up on an appeal, a mandamus, something or other, and they kept losing, but at least it drug everything out. And when he came back and learned about the acceptance process, and he did an acceptance and a return, and he got his attorney and the rest of the copies of that document to go before the prosecutor and the judge, basically the prosecutor just was bad-mouthing him until it came the morning for the trial. And the judge had come through the documents to notice that it appeared as though our friend was trying to offer some kind of a plea of acceptance or guilty or whatever. And so the judge said to the prosecutor, have you attempted to do a plea bargain? And the prosecutor said no. And the judge said, well, why don't you at least give it a try? And so, basically, our friend again said that he'd plead guilty to everything in exchange for settlement and closure and release of the title, but he wanted an OR bond. And the prosecutor just acted like he heard what he wanted to hear and nothing else. And he finally said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll drop 70 of the charges if you'll plead guilty to one. And so, not being able to argue with anything, he agreed to do that. And by the time everything was done, the court basically dismissed the jury and uh, he was now pled guilty to one charge. The court gave him about four weeks to sentencing. He went back for sentencing, which was a week or so ago. And a very interesting thing happened. Now, I had talked with him like we discussed last week, the concepts of what the court is looking for from the living man in the allocution statement at sentencing, i.e., they want your opinion as to whether you are a danger to the public, whether you have admitted the crime of a straw man, whether you have felt sorry for what you've done, whether you're remorseful and have offered to pay back or to make whole the so-called damaged parties. And so our hero had done all that. And remember, going into the sentencing, we have found out that the pre-sentence report that is filled out by probation services is an extremely critical part of this process. That pre-sentence report is important it's the so-called offer or charging instrument going into this new phase of the proceedings, this sentencing hearing. And you cannot be in a position of dishonor to that offer, and you cannot dishonor the probation services department by not working with them or cooperating with them in gathering the information. If you are dishonorable to probation services, 
you have gotten the reputation of not being an honorable person and that affects your ability to go in as the responsible uh, party for the evil 15-year-old and deal with this whole deal in sentencing. So, our hero went into the sentencing. He'd helped fill out the report. He'd done everything. And needless to say, somebody going into the sentencing 